<clears throat> All right, there we go. I am in like Flynn. Uh, and I've got phlegm in me. If you don't know what phlegm is, phlegm is that that bull crap that's uh, in the back of your neck. It's in your sinuses. And it's very aggravating, man, because I've been sick since the beginning of November. And that kind of sounds like a weenie thing to say because I've not actually been sick since the beginning of November, but I have, um, I have had phlegm. I've had phlegm. I've been phlegmed up for way too long and it's aggravating because I'm trying to put on a good production and sound professional but it's hard to sound professional when you load it down with flam. You can hear it. Listen, hear it. Uh, uh, uh. And maybe, maybe it's just my vocal cords are completely and teetotally shot from coughing, from hacking, from yelling at my child i don't know but let's just get right into this this morning and i'm pouring up stinking beautiful beautiful cup of joe i'm so excited to drink this and just relax for an hour or so it's been a hard week and here i go again dude all i do is complain it's been a great week what am i talking about it's been fine ain't been nothing wrong with this week uh, here we go, boys. Here we go, ladies. Uh, get a sip of this coffee. Ah, good gum, man. What's the, let me see here. Yeah, boy. Metal coffee. Will kick you in the pants. <laughs> um, whenever you ask uh, a crowd of people if they like metal coffee, they go <laughs> because it's so good. <clears throat> I have increased the production factor of this show. I decided that if I was going to do it. I was going to do it moderately right. And rather than just sit down at the old desk chair there and talk for an hour, I was like, man, I should invest in some good chairs. Uh, a little bit of furniture, some lighting, and just really do this right. That way I could have guests on and... It be a little bit more legit and be able to actually do videos of it because I've done the videos in the past. But the problem was I didn't have any kind of lights. I didn't have um, I just didn't have the setup to make it look appealing like you. I would watch it back and I'd be like, dude, this looks like it was filmed with a potato. And I didn't like that. So I decided that I'm going to do. I'm gonna do. It. I'm gonna change my ways. I'm gonna start doing things right and sit in a good chair. And you can see this beaver hide, dude. Look at that. See that beaver hide? Them some beavers that I I helped trap. I didn't necessarily trap them. Um, I didn't want the blood on my hands, so to speak. That's that's a joke. Um, no, my father-in-law is big into trapping, and he trapped a few beeves, and he was like, "Hey, dude." Come help me, come help me with these beeves. And I was like, dude, you called, you called, I don't, I don't know anybody that you could have called that would have aided you more for these beeves. And I was like, I just want some hides. I want to try to make me a beeve hat. And the beeve hat was going to be, uh, like the first and foremost thing that I done. So I got a couple hides and I honestly probably got enough to do a beef hat, a dang good beef hat. But 
Um, I just like them. I like the pelts so much, and I get so much use out of them. I know you'd think, like, what would you do with the beef pelt? But the beef pelt, you can you can drape it over an arm on an armchair. You can use it as that little neat rug that you keep your floor dry with when you step out of the shower or tub. You can use a beef pelt for heck, you could make a loincloth. You don't even have to you don't even have to sew any. You could just poke a hole. You can just poke some holes in the uh, beave and just like run a safe, I don't know, a safety pin or something through the beave to keep it over you, your privets, you know? And that gone, man. That gone it. What people just text me. All day, every day. <clears throat> if it's not my work phone, it's this stinking personal phone. And curse that thing. I, the only reason I kept it on the show is I was wanting to use it to look up the news. That way we could go over any kind of outdoor-related news or just what it, whatever we found. But, yeah, you can use a beef pelt for anything. And one of the coolest things to me is just to, to just leave it laying around inconveniently for your wife. Because it's really not an inconvenience, but to them, it's the biggest inconvenience. They cannot stand. They cannot stand having a beef pelt draped around the house. Just make sure, make sure your tan is dry. Make sure if you got any kind of oils or anything like that on it, that it's clean and dry and ready to go. Take that beef pelt and just drape it over her spot on the couch. And she will will come up to that and see that and be so furious with you over this beef pelt. Now, if you really want to ante it up, you can do a coyote pelt because coyotes have this stanky musk to them like like your weird uncle that comes around and you just like he has his own smell that's the way these coyotes are if you really want to get her drape that thing drape one of them stanky coyote hides over her favorite spot on the couch and she will be livid with you Ah, uh, but yeah I'm gonna I upgraded the production a bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna trap some more stuff. I'm gonna tan it and just drape it all around uh, the podcast studio area and just really trick it out, dude. We're gonna trick it out, and I want to have some guests on. I I wanted to have some people on already that I've not. <clears throat> and I've kind of pushed it back because I had I had my toes in the water kind of thing. But lately I was like, I've got to, I got to go in all in and just do this right because I don't want to have a super good podcast of dad because so many people want me to do like a solo episode with dad and just get him to carry on that I, I wanted to do it with good lights and good cameras and good action. That way I could make like clips out of it shorts and i tried to do the cartoon thing with the turkey but that was a lot of fun but it was difficult it was very difficult that little turkey video that i did took man that thing took like four hours for me to draw all of that and i know it's just like simple cartoony drawing but to line it up to make it wiggle like a cartoon does was so difficult and it took took a long time <clears throat> but uh enough of all that enough of the griping let's just get into some topics here and let's start let's start shooting for the moon right the moon um deer season has pretty much come and gone especially for us or for 
rifle hunters. I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself technically or solely a rifle hunter, but past couple years, I have been known to take a rifle. With rifle season being gone, I've seen a lot of posts of people that have shot deer. And I'm so happy for them, man. They've got big bucks. They've got little does. They've got big does. And they've got little bucks. Maybe even a hermaphrodite. And I love to see the people gripping them deer and just happy and going to eat them and get jerky, sausage made out of them. It's just a beautiful thing. But I've also noticed that a lot of people really want to talk about gun calibers. And I strolled across a post the other day that just absolutely chapped me. It chapped me so bad. It was on Facebook. And I don't know, I don't know if you've noticed, but like the comment section on Instagram will be either someone legit that actually has something to say that adds to the conversation, or it will be like some kind of foreign uh, me so sexy, click here now for good time. It's one of the two. That's all you get on Instagram. Now on <clears throat> on Facebook, it's a totally different thing. You go to the comment section, and the the dumbest people will comment on Facebook stuff, and it aggravates me to no end. Like I don't I don't even know why I click to look and see what people are talking about on these posts because. I have unfollowed so many people on Facebook that at this point I've only got like maybe 50 friends that I actually follow on there. Like if if you if I add you or you add me, which I don't know that I've ever added anybody, but if you add me, I accept that. And you post a bunch of crap like every day. Whether it be a recipe, like you you're sharing a recipe so that you can come back and find it later. I have to suffer through that. I had to see that. I had to see your praline cookie recipe. And I didn't want to. At all. So with that being said. Facebook. Uh, like I, I unfollowed everyone. And now that I'm unfollowed to everyone. It has to generate stuff to show me. Because the people that I do follow don't post enough to show me stuff. So if I open Facebook and just start mindlessly zombie scrolling through it, it's going to show me like things that the algorithm has picked up on that I like. Coffee, guns, hunting, bows, um, playboy. No, I'm joking. Uh, but it'll, like, it'll populate stuff constantly that it thinks I want to see. And the other day, it it posted this thing about this dude. He had, he had posted on like a hunt whitetail, I don't know, whitetails of America or whatever. And he was like, um, going to get a new deer gun. What caliber should I get? I'm thinking either 6.5 Creedmoor, 243, or 308. I think were his choices. And dude, that comment section was purely, it was filth. It was filth. And I don't mean like cussing or uh, dirty jokes kind of filth. It was just disgusting to look at that comment section and see a bunch of grown men barking back and forth at each other about which caliber is the best. And guess what? All of the calibers were legal. They weren't even illegal calibers. So why would you get on there and moan and cry and be a big baby about somebody using a 6.5 Creedmoor? 
Oh, well, the 6.5 Creedmoor was technically designed to be used as an accurate, very uh, long-range target rifle. Uh, dude, I don't care. The 4570 was made to be an anti-tank gun, I believe. Anti-vehicle gun. Cow milk was made to be drank by calves. Not people. And I've got cow milk in my coffee. You want, You know what honey was made for? Honey was made for bees, for bees to drink or eat. They're down there going, eating honey in their hive. Guess what's in my coffee? Honey. You know what coffee was made for? I think the coffee bean is a little seed. We roast it and mush it up. We squish the beans up. (laughs) Oh, We squish the beans up. Pour hot water over it into and, and drink it. So shut up about what caliber a grown man is using to shoot a deer with. If I could give you any advice at all with your gun or deer hunting, whatever. Practice. Practice. Do you shoot a two forty three? Practice. Know what your gun does. Do you shoot a 300 wind mag? Practice! Yes, if you hit a deer in the liver with the 300 wind mag versus a 223, you're probably going to find the deer faster or you'll be more successful with the 300 wind mag. You also might scope ring your eyebrow off. You also, you might have one eyebrow for the rest of your life. But practice, please, practice. That is that is literally all you have to do. It's, it's shot placement. Shot placement. There's only a couple factors that come into play when choosing a rifle round. You either, you either want something that will cut through brush, 30-30, 45-70, mag, um, 350 le- legend maybe, uh, 450 Bushmaster, I think it's a 450 Bushmaster. You know, that's the, that's that's one big factor. Maybe you need to cut through some brush, okay? And you don't want the Spitzer sharp bullet round cutting through brush because of the angle of the bullet, dude. The bullet is shaped like this. So when it hits a limb, it's going to start deviating that bullet unless it dead centers it, but then it's going to probably start tumbling. Who knows what? But if you're shooting a 4570, just chunk, just a brick, that baby is going to go where you want it to more often. That's one factor. The next factor is distance. Maybe you live out west. Maybe you're an elk hunter in Colorado. You would want a round that has a flat trage- trajectory. You would want a round that has a lot of beef to it, 300 Weatherby, 300 Wind Mag, uh, 7 millimeter Mag, something like that. Maybe you're getting a 300-yard shot or a 200-yard shot on a big bull elk. I don't know like exactly a lot about that, but I just know that this is a factor. You wouldn't take a 4570 out there unless you were hunting in some like brush thicket with a bunch of elk in it. That's factor number two, distance. The only other thing that I could think of is size. What are you shooting? Are you shooting a coyote? 223. Um, I don't know. Whatever the heck. Some some round that will shoot. And once again, are you in the woods? Are you in a big field? That's going to dictate what kind of round you want. Like you don't have to. You don't have to get on Facebook and be like. 30-30 30-30 or nothing. If you're not shooting a 30-30 at your deer, you're an idiot. Man, screw those kinds of guys. Screw them. That looks so bad, and you look like such a moron by commenting that stuff. Unless you comment and say 22 long rifle or 17 HMR to be sarcastic and funny, or... A bazooka. 
scroll on. But the problem is those people will never listen to this because they're idiots. And I think the only thing they listen to is probably Barney. They probably watch Barney or something weird. Maybe Teletubbies. They probably watch the Teletubbies. And when the big sun baby comes up, that's their favorite part. They're probably like, Jesus, dude. I am chapped this morning about this caliber stuff. Yeah, dude, daggone, man. Just figure out your scenario. Get the caliber that works best for you. And make sure it's legal. That's that's it's it. I have a friend that uses a twenty two Hornet to shoot deer with. I think it's a twenty two Hornet. That's what it's called. It's it's the smallest center fire round I've ever seen in my life. It's like a. It looks like a bellied out twenty two mag or something. Just big enough for a for a primer in the back of it. And you might be saying, oh, man, that's unethical. There's no way. Don't do that. Don't use that caliber. And yeah, for a lot of people, that would be a terrible caliber to use. The way that I deer hunt, terrible caliber to use. The way he deer hunts, excellent caliber to use. Why? Because he shoots them right in the neck. This thing is precise. Very precise. It's almost like people don't shoot a lot. I think that's the problem is people just don't shoot much. So they don't, they're talking out of their butt. They don't know what they're talking about. I could take that 22 Hornet and just crack deer in the neck, drop them where they stand almost every time. Within reason, you know, like a certain range. Now, if it's some like terrible shot that I'm shaky on or like free handing a 200 yard neck shot. I might not take it. I don't know. But daggone, man. Yeah. Chill out on griping at these people about the caliber they use. I don't care what anyone uses. I just want them to practice. If I could pick, if some dude comes to me and he's like, I use a 223 to shoot deer with, I'd be like, hmm, nice. That, that's the end of the conversation. I would never say anything else unless. He asked me. It's called unsolicited advice. If you see a dude with a hammer and he's beating on a nail with the handle and he's gripping the actual hammerhead part and you, you just see him doing that and you're like, man, that, that, that sucks. That's never going to work. Let me give you some advice because, see, you have solicited yourself to listen to this podcast. What I mean by that is you chose to listen to this. That dude with the hammer did not choose, unless you're his boss or something, did not choose. He did not solicit himself to listen to your bullcrap. And you're only going to make him mad if you walk up and you're like, dude, you're holding that hammer wrong. That, that would just make him mad. It's like a goat. If you, if you grab a goat and you want it to go this way, you push the opposite way. Because the goat is so dumb that it's just like, I have to do not what this thing wants me to do. Because they're idiots. And if, if you give unsolicited advice, there's been a time or two, if it's in the right situation, it comes off right. Like if it's your buddy... And he sees you struggling. For example, I had not shot many ARs. I was like, and, and this kind of stuff sticks in your head. Like it, it, for me, it burns into my brain. And I never forget it when people give me unsolicited advice. Because I either really, really learn from it or it makes me really, really mad. So like I said, I had not shot many ARs. I had never, I don't even know that I'd ever loaded an AR mag. The only mags that I'd ever loaded <clears throat> was, let's see, probably like a little 22 pistol mag, uh, Ruger 10 mags. And most magazines, whenever you go to load them, 
they have the slider on the side and they have that little groove cut out that the the back of the rim fire round goes down into then you push the round back you can't push the round straight in from the top so if you if you do shoot ARs you already know where I'm going with this to load an AR mag, you can just set the round directly on top and push down. You don't have to push it in and then slide it back. I didn't know that because I'd never used them. I was just trying to be helpful and load our mags up so we could shoot. And he watched me do about three or four. And it was, it was probably painful. And if he had any sense, he was probably in his head like, man, should I say something? I don't want to give this guy unsolicited advice, but we were friends. So that's the difference. We were buddies. I kind of looked to him to, to, do, to watch out for me like that. And I would expect him to do the same thing with me. So if he's trying to put his bolts in his tire or his wheel <laughs> and he's twisting the nuts the wrong way, uh, I'm going to tell him, like, hey, dude, twist them the other way. So he says, hey. Why don't you try just sticking the bullet straight down from the top? He's like, you don't have to slot, stick them in, then slide them back. And I was like, oh my God, I'm an idiot. I felt like the dumbest human on the planet. And it was probably the first time that I'd ever loaded an AR mag. So that stuck with me. And I remember how that felt. And it was, like I said, okay, because he was my buddy. It worked out. Now, if it was just some douchebag at the range, just like, you know you're loading that mag wrong, right? You, you, don't, have to, you don't have to slide them in. You can just stick them straight down. Like he walks up like all G.I. Joe trying to show me how to do crap. That would make me mad. Even though I would have learned the proper way to load that magazine, I still would have been ticked off. Ticked off because of that like you, you don't you don't do that you don't do that to people unsolicited advice so if you see a dude using a 22 hornet for deer hunting don't like you don't know what he's doing you don't know his situation now if he comes to you and he's like man i don't know what's going on i keep shooting these deer and i can't find them they keep getting away and you kind of got to determine in your head does this guy just want to gripe or is this guy beating around the bush looking for me to help him? That's what you got to juggle. And it's it's difficult. It really is. But you should, you can usually pick up on it. If you really think about it and focus, you can pick up on when somebody wants something from you, like some kind of advice, like they're reaching out to you. Or if they're just wanting to gripe. Somebody that just wants to gripe, you can talk to them, and it's pretty quick. It's, you can tell pretty quick that they just want to gripe, because as soon as you start to even like offer a solution or voice your opinion, they just start yammering on about something else. If it's that kind of person, cut your losses. Just listen to them ramble about their dumb problem that they they're never going to fix. They're not looking for advice. They just want to gripe about it. And listen at them and enjoy. It's almost like watching a TV show or a movie. Just be like, man, that guy is so dumb. This is crazy. Now, if it's somebody that comes to you and it's like, hey, I keep shooting these deer and they just keep getting away. Like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. The first, the first, whether it be archery, rifle, anything, the first thing I'm going to say or ask is, um, I kind of fill out the situation and make sure that they want to, they actually want my opinion. And step one is, are you, are you having buck fever? Are you, do you have target panic? Because if you take a dude that has, let's pause for a second. I got to get some more coffee. Jeez, dad gone. I'm about to go off right here, dude. I gotta freshen this cup up, boys. Get it, get it warmed up for me. Mm. Man, that is good. 
You hear that Stanley cracking open? Dude, this thing saved my life in deer season. I think I talked about that last podcast. Woo, look at that steam, boy. Mmm. That right there will make you want to stink and eat a steak backwards. I guess that'd be puking. Maybe not eat a steak backwards. All right, let's get a big sip of that hot joe. All right, here we go. You can have you can have the most expensive top of the line gear, high quality, the best of everything. And if you can't squeeze that trigger and get a surprise shot, you're going to shoot like dog crap. You are going to shoot like dog crap. It's called target panic, buck fever, whatever. You can have the nicest crap ever, and I've done it. I used to have junky bows, and I'd be like, man, if I could only get the good release, that would solve my problems. Man, if I could only get the good bow, that would solve my problems. Oh, these cheap arrows. Man, if I could just afford the, if I could afford the Eastons, that would solve my problems. No, it's not your sight. It's not your bow, it's not your arrows, it's not your release, it's not your it's it's not even your grip, it's not your form. You're you're smashing the trigger. If you're if you're clapping that trigger, dude. If you're clap just ringing out that trigger every time you shoot, I don't care what you're using. It's not going to shoot good. It won't work. So step 1 before buying all this bull crap is addressing the target panic, the buck fever. That's what you're doing. Missing a ton of deer, you get back to camp, it's like, don't know what happened. Don't know what happened. You done a drive-by with your sight pin and slapped the trigger when the when the dot got anywhere close to his vitals. That's what happened. You know what happened. You just don't know what the problem is. I've been there. I've done it. I shot a deer in the butt cheek one time. I feel terrible about it. I still feel terrible about it to this day. Work on the target panic. Now, if you don't have target panic, that same dude comes to me and he's like, man, I'm shooting these deer and they're just, they're getting away. I'd be like, let's go shoot or whatever. You know, if I didn't know how good of a shot they were. And, Man, if we get to the range, they're shooting a group like this. This dude's shooting like an inch and a half group at 100 yards. He's a great shot, you know? Why is he a great shot? Because he's not jerking the trigger. But I would still be like, are you are you getting buck fever when the deer come out, you know? Because that can happen. Maybe, maybe you're composed and calm and cool on the range. You can squeeze that shot off. But it's a different situation when the deer comes out. So the deer comes out and the dude's jerking the trigger, maybe. He'd be like, no, dude, I'm, I'm right on him. I'm squeezing the trigger, getting a surprise shot. <clears throat> He's like, I just can't explain it. Then I'd be like, what kind of caliber are you using? And he, so he says, you know, a 30 out 6 It's like, okay. Are you hunting in thickets? Are you shooting? Are you trying to use it as a brush gun? And he's like, no, I'm out in the wide open. Then there's something really bad wrong because he should definitely be killing him. <laughs> if he's out in the wide open with a 30 out six, there is no, I'm not seeing any, unless it's just bad ammo. I don't even think they make, they might make some kind of like match grade 30 out six ammo that's like, a, you know, not made for shooting deer. But I think they actually make some varmint 30 out six ammo too. Seems like I've seen before. Um, it's like a, a really small projectile rather than the normal 30 out six one. It's still a 30 caliber, obviously, but it's just like a little short smushed down version. So the dude, if he comes to me and he's like, they just keep getting away. And he's like, I'm using a 223. Then I'd be like, mm. because I've used a 223 
<clears throat> my wife has used a 223. A cousin of mine used my 223. And we all had success. But what you have to take into account here is every one of those shots literally blew the heart out. Um, which is what you have to do with the 223. And when you have like a woman or some new shooter that's not used to the situation, you kind of have to you kind of have to do a balancing act of I want to give them all of the power that they can have, but I also don't want them to jack their shoulder or, or ring their eyeball with the stinking scope ring. <clears throat> so it's like a balancing act. You don't want to give them something that's just super strong that's going to scare them. And you also want to make sure that the deer's going to die. So, like a two two three is kind of on the line. I wouldn't want to give it to somebody that I knew couldn't shoot good. Like, if it's somebody that I'm a little shaky on, like, I don't know how good of a shot this person is, or, like, they kind of they kind of suck at shooting, then I'd be like, you should probably shoot, like, a two seventy or a .30-06 or something a little, a little beefier, maybe a thirty thirty if you're in the woods, you know. But that's that. You don't want to be going for heart shots with the twenty two Hornet. It just sounds like a place of hurt and pain. Um, and you don't want to be going for a neck shot with like a forty five seventy that you're grouping like this at a hundred. If you're shooting like a four inch group at a hundred yards with your forty five seventy, probably good for like a brush gun aiming at vitals, but you're not going to want to go for some precision shot of trying to hit that deer down in the neck and like shatter bone. To me, if you're going for neck shots, you want something super fast that's going to absolutely explode on impact and just cause a massive wound channel. So like a 4570, they're not, they're not going faster than the speed of sound most of the time, I don't think. I don't know. Let's see. Maybe they maybe they do go supersonic. Let's try this. We'll say forty five seventy ballistics. Sure. Actually, let's try just FPS. Forty five seventy feet per second. Um, it looks like a 4570. Ooh, dang. Yeah, that's uh, 1,800 feet per second, so that is supersonic. And that's standard pressure, I believe. Um, but yeah, so you'd have to, you'd have to really bog that baby down and heavy it up or lose some powder to get it down there going subsonic. So it is a subsonic round, but... It's not going just stupid fast, and it's not going to blow like a huge hole. To me, like if you were shooting some kind of just super fast, small round at the neck, I feel like you'd be pretty successful. Like my daughter just shot a buck, and she used my 6.5 Grendel, and it's a blazing fast little round that goes in the AR. Granted, it is a pretty good sized projectile but it, it's a good candidate for like coyote hunting or neck shots um or you can kind of go for heart shots with it i've seen it done and i've done it it, it, it will work but she cracked that thing right in the neck and honestly she barely missed the actual vertebrae like the spine and neck bones that go up she actually missed those by a hair but there was so much pressure on the round, and it was moving so fast that when it hit the neck, that bullet hit that neck like it'd be like hitting concrete. And when it did, it had so much devastation and like blowout of that bullet just going like, blah, you know, hitting its neck so fast that it paralyzed it and dropped the deer. I walked down and popped it one more time in the heart just to end misery, no pain, you know. Out as quick as we can go. And that's a good round for that. That's a good shot to take. Like if you have just a stupid precision gun, 
like uh, the 22 Hornet or something along those lines that's legal, completely legal to use in the state of Kentucky, that's something I'd do neck shots with, like my buddy does. He'll aim, like he knows he knows the deer's anatomy, like if it's head sideways, and it's like a 70-yard shot or whatever, he knows exactly where to aim right, you know, on its neck to kill it instantly. If it's a front-facing shot, obviously, a uh, rear-facing shot, it's just, it's it's like a euthanization round it's going to be perfect now let's say he's shooting dead on and misses a little bit over to the side well you got your two arteries on each side of that so hopefully he's cutting one of those and killing it uh beyond that really it's just meat like i I feel like i feel like with the next shot you're either gonna kill that deer immediately and drop it and be able to find it no problem or you missed it so bad that you didn't hit anything and i don't know like i i've i've really thought about the neck shots lately and it seems like a pretty good a pretty good tactic and it don't seem like something that i'd want to try at 200 300 yards but you know it's it's something kind of viable and a lot of people gripe and be like unethical That's unethical. Shouldn't be doing that. Well, you shoot at coyotes' heads. Is a coyote's life different than a deer's? Is it more valuable than or less valuable than a deer's life? What about a squirrel? People shoot squirrels in the guts with 22s all the time and they crawl into their nest and just lay there like, ah, gut shot. Is that ethical? No, it's not. So, get off your high horse is what I'm trying to say. We're actively killing animals. You're taking their life. Um, and yeah, we should be able to do it as ethical as possible, as quick as possible. I don't want no deer to suffer. Why would anybody want that? That's, that's some sadistic, put you on a list kind of behavior. So, we want the deer to go down as fast as possible. Why would somebody who is just deadly with this 22 Hornet be shamed for going for neck shots? It's crazy to me. Crazy. Once again, it's crazy that a bunch of grown men bicker and pick back and forth about gun calibers. Somebody comes to me griping about the caliber. Can the person shoot? First and foremost, can they shoot? I would rather I would rather me be shooting at a deer with a 17 HMR than some idiot that's going to blast it in the guts with a 30 6 Because you know what's going to happen to that deer? He's going to run off. His guts will be hanging out of him. Uh, he'll bed down 100 yards from where, 200 yards from where you shot him. You'll track him. Got him real good. Shot him right where I want to, boss. Let's go track him. And you walk up to the blood, and there's acorns in the blood. And it's dark. And like, not looking good. What does this idiot do? Probably going to track it anyways. Because they're dumb. And it gets tracked. And then bumped. And then track some more, and then bump because it's such a big one. You don't want to you don't want to leave them overnight or whatever. And tracked and bumped, and then never found. So the deer gets wasted. The meat gets wasted. The deer went through an immense amount of suffering. When if it were me or somebody that's a, I'm, I'm not trying to brag and be like I'm such a good shot, but if it was somebody that's a good shot with some small caliber, I would pick that person. Nine, nine out of ten, no, ten out of ten times. Because I know that person is going to crack them where they need to be cracked and drop the deer. Practice. Practice is where it's at. Not caliber, not gun, not equipment, none of that to practice. And beating target panic. That's probably the main thing. Uh, yeah, target panic's more honestly more than practice 
because that's a tough one. I, I want to do like a whole episode just about target panic one day, how I beat it. <coughs> Flynn back got me right then. Woo. Ah, there you go. Oh, dude, Flynn just tried to choke me to death. <coughs> Woo. What I was saying was, I want to do a full episode on Target Panic. Start to finish, how I overcame it, <clears throat> and how uh, I think other people could overcome it. Because that made such a difference in my shooting. It, it was crazy. I used to jerk the trigger on guns. I had definitely done it on the bow. Um, and once I beat that, it was the most freeing feeling ever. And if you don't know what it is or if you don't have it, it's not even like you're just like, what What are you talking about? But if you do and you get over it, oh, man. You hear people talk about like being an alcoholic and uh, overcoming it and turning sober. Like how they talk about that. It's almost the same. Well, I don't want to disparage or nothing like that but i have to imagine beating target panic is something at least a little similar you know not saying that it's a similar thing obviously i'm just saying that beating target panic is like a super free and feeling that is amazing you come you come away from it and you're like man i feel like i could do anything now because that's how big of a deal it was to me like i could not shake it man i would I'd pull my bow back or rest my gun and be in my head like, don't jerk the trigger. What don't you're not even going to know if the gun's on. If you jerk the trigger, don't jerk the trigger. Then, then I jerk the trigger or the release, whichever. And I'd be like, man, what, what, like, what is this? Why can I not hack this? It seems like something so, uh, like something that would be easy to overcome because it's all mental, but it's not that gone. It's not, it is so tough. But yeah, once I, once I broke it, um, man, I could, you could hand me anything and I can shoot it like a gun. What, what you got to remember, like after you do beat target panic or once you're trying to beat it and understand it, and are aware that you have it or whatever. All you have to do is hold the crosshairs or the dot on your target and squeeze. And you're like, man, I can't, I can't hold the crosshairs. I can't hold the crosshairs on the dot. So they're trying to like time the crosshairs on the dot and wait for it to get on the dot. And as soon as it gets on the dot, <clears throat> they're like jerking a mile one way or the other. And you walk up there and it's like this far to the side. So what do you do? You you adjust the scope over. You walk back. You shoot again. Same thing. <clears throat> now it's way on the other side. So you be like, oh, I just over adjusted. It's like, who even knows what you did? Because you're jerking the trigger. There's no way to know. Just hold the dot or the crosshair on the target as best you can. That's that's plenty good enough. If you're free handing and you're you you know like a not an old feeble person or whatever, or a kid, you should be able to freehand at like 100 yards and hit an eight inch target. Why do it? Like turn your brain off. Like I'm not even shooting. Like I'm not even planning on shooting this gun right now. Walk out to a hundred with like an eight inch target, pull your gun up, and just hold the crosshairs on the on the target. And you'll be amazed at how good you can hold the crosshairs on the target. You're like, man, I can, I'm, I'm kind of like right on this thing. Or at least for me, that's the, the way it is for me. And literally all you have to do while you're doing that is just start squeezing the trigger. Are you going to be in the middle of the target? Who knows? Who knows? Maybe. But freehanding an eight inch target with like a scoped gun or something at a hundred yards, it's it's kind of impressive. 
It's pretty impressive. Chances are, if you freehand that thing and shoot 10 rounds, you you can probably hit it and your gun's dead on. You're probably going to hit it every shot. And when you walk up there to it, you'll be amazed at how many are like right in the, or close to the middle. That's all, that's like all there is to it is holding as best you can in your given situation and squeezing, squeezing. And I know there's some other factors that come into play, like things moving or, you know, what have you, but that's, that's literally all you have to do. That's your only job. Put dot or cro- it's a little different with the bow because you got anchor and all that, that that's something that. I heard a dude griping about one time. A guy, gosh, another Facebook moron. This dude posts a video of himself shooting his bow. And he's like, looking for advice. Can't seem to get any better. What What am I doing wrong? And I think he already knew what he was doing wrong. He, he draws his bow back in the video and it's in slow motion. And his, his grip was a little wonky. It kind of looked like he was death gripping it. But what do I look at in the video? You look at their finger, whatever they're activating the trigger with or activating the release with, and you look at their eyes, especially if it's in slow motion, because it is the, it's an immediate tell of what they're doing. They'll be, they'll be anchored and they got their finger on the trigger. And almost every time, if they have target panic, they will blink and then the trigger will go off. It's, it's super easy to see in slow motion. And if you see a dude with pointing like this and then just going boom and like just guillotining that trigger, same thing. They're, that, that's where you start. And I commented on it because I wanted to help the guy. I, I truly did. He was asking for help and I'm a decent shot. And a lot of the comments were just like, oh, dude, I almost wanted to DM this guy and be like, please don't listen to anything those people are saying. They're morons. I'll help you, but I didn't. I just made a comment on the video. And I said, before anything else, fix, you're punching your trigger like really bad. Just fix that first, and then you can start worrying about the smaller details. I was like, there's a lot of comments on here talking about other things. And yes, they're important, but they're not important unless you're squeezing that trigger because you're not going to know. Unless you're getting a surprise shot, you're you're literally you will never know what your bottleneck is. And this dude comments back, and he's like saying that that's the only thing that's important is stupid. Like his grip is terrible. That's that's what's causing a lot of his problems is his misses and blah 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 blah. And I was just like, dude, how can you, how can you even say that? Like how 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 are you so dumb that that's what you think? <laughs> How are you so dumb that that's what you think? Because, like, it doesn't even make logical sense to think that way. Like, if you've seen a dude throwing a baseball and he has, like, his form's okay, but he's, you can see, like, a few things. He's not picking his foot up high enough or he's not keeping his, eye, his neck straight or whatever. But. He's closing his eyes the whole time he throws the ball. You're going to be like immediately, dude, all this other stuff is like, it's like a pyramid, you know, like of which is the most important or whatever, prioritize. And the main thing is like, dude, you got to, you got to start leaving your eyes open when you're winding up to throw. Like to me, that's obviously like we're going to fix that first then we can start working on your grip and blah 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 and your peep sight whatever you know and i I just can't understand how people don't get that it's almost like it's definitely gotten more prevalent but back when i first like started tapping into it the buck fever target panic thing nobody really talked about it especially then and now it seems like it's kind of come around because you've got people like john dudley and other bow hunters uh archery people that have come up and made it more popular. So it's gone a little more viral and definitely more talked about, but it's almost like people just do not want to admit that they punch that trigger. 
they can't they can't admit that it's almost like they're less of a man or something if they say that they punch the trigger and i kind of get it because when i was younger that's that's what i was doing i was like man i can't wait to get a new sight we're getting a new sight on this thing this sight's killing me like no the sight's not killing me because i've done it before with other people's bows that want me to set stuff up on it um specifically one guy he he actually passed away not too long ago he was a pretty good good dude but he wanted me to help him side in and i didn't know how good he could shoot he wanted to use a single pin like i i used and i kind of told him what to get and whatnot and he was like man i can't get this single pin right will you come help me i was like yeah sure so I show up, and we set a target up, and we start shooting. And immediately, I seen what the problem was. He was just, uh, for one, like he, he was a new shooter, so he didn't have like good form and whatnot yet. And also, he was punching the trigger a little. And maybe he was nervous because I was there watching him or whatever, you know. Like I used to be like that too. If people were watching me shoot, I'd fall to pieces. And... You're never going to be able to sight in a single pin bow sight if you're just dropping the hammer on that trigger. So I told him, I was blunt with him. I was like, look, man, I was like, a lot of your shots are like really good, but every now and then you're, you're punching the trigger bad and you're torquing the bow like you're getting too excited. And I was like, and I know how it is because I used to do that really bad. I said, the main thing that you could work on would be that. To get better. Like if you want to get better at this. That that would be my priority. Is trying to get a surprise shot. Every shot. Never punching that trigger. Then you'll know if you were gripping it too tight. Or if you're like missing this way or that way. And I said what I can do. Is I can shoot your bow. And get your sight tape picked out. Because it doesn't matter who picks out the sight tape. As long as you're hitting the same elevation on that target. That's the priority. So... I took his bow and he was, he was like dead on at 20. I mean, he could shoot like a four inch group or three inch group at 20. I mean, good enough to shoot, to go hunting and like shoot at a deer with and try to kill it. But the single pin was basically useless for him because like as soon as he'd get back to 30 or 40, he was just all over the target and my light went out. And what I did was, I went to 20 and shot and I hit like way low left or whatever. So now all I had to do was go back to 60 and get that arrow to go in the same hole. So I go back to like 60 and I shoot and I was like four inches above that hole. I was like, okay, just take it this way a little bit. So I took it back up some shot again and the, the arrow, I swear to you, literally went in the same hole as his other. And I was confident. The shots felt great. So there was no point in dilly-dallying. I had my 20 marked and I had the 60 marked because the pointer was on 60. So I picked out a sight tape and I told him, I was like, look, we just got to make sure this lines up with your 20 and this 60 lines up with where I just shot at 60. So we do that. We get it squared away. And on there, and I was like, all right, watch this. So I grabbed like three of his arrows, and I went to 20, shot. Went back to like 40, shot. Went back to 60, shot. And, dude, I made myself look so good. (laughs) He was probably like, dang, this guy's awesome. Because I usually don't shoot this good. I mean, like, I I shoot decent, but today, like, I, I made myself look like a champion. I grouped those babies. The 20, 30, and 60 were all, like, touching with his bow. So he he had to know, like, okay, it's not my bow, it's me. And which, nine times out of ten, that's the case anyways, unless you're torquing it or just have something terribly wrong with your bow. <clears throat> Heck yeah. Man, I think, I've, uh, I think I've enjoyed this. I like this chair that I'm in and the beaver pelt and the atmosphere. Uh. The light went out on me, so I think I'm going to wrap up. I will have some new lights that I can I can kind of change and do a move around with and see what we can accomplish. 
But uh, I appreciate you for listening or watching if you're on YouTube, because I think I'm going to start putting these on YouTube. And I was also thinking about changing the name of the podcast and uh, just making it more like like my thing or whatever. And also to where it's not just like Get Lucky Outdoors podcast. Because for one, that's a mouthful. And two, it's not really... I don't want to feel like I'm trapped and only doing outdoor stuff because if I want to talk to some random Bob that I think is funny, like I would like to be able to talk to the random Bob and not be like trying to ask him, so do you like, do you like fish ever? Or do you, do you ever deer hunt? Because, you know, like it's, it's outdoors based. I'm an outdoorsy fella and I always will be, but I would like to be able to talk to just whoever the heck I want to about whatever the heck I want to. And, you know, go from there i appreciate you for watching listening and that's the end of this one we will catch you next time